Today I want to talk to you about law number six of the laws of teamwork. It's called the law of the catalyst. And the law of the catalyst says winning teams have players that make things happen. In other words, catalysts are what I call get it done and then some people. That's just who they are. And by the way, by now in the training videos and in the studio here today, you're probably feeling pretty good because you, you've got five teamwork laws under your belt. And, and you already feel like you're a better team player. Isn't that true, huh? I mean, you just say, oh, I, I, this is huge. This is, how, how many of you just feel you're probably a little bit better now than you were a while ago? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, that's good, good. Can I tell you something? You're not that good yet. <laughs> You've got 12 laws to go. So, so, so look at your neighbor and say, you're good, but not that good. All right, huh? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> One of the privileges I have in teaching leadership for companies and organizations is every once in a while I get to do something that's really a lot of fun. And, and uh, this year I was able to go to Washington, D.C. and do the NBA All-Star Game. And be a, being a basketball fan, this was, this was fun, okay. And so I went and spoke to the players and some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, personnel in, in basketball. And uh, when I finished speaking, uh, Ed Rush, who's the head of the NBA officials, came up to me and introduced himself. And he said, John, he said, we take your book, uh, The 21 Qualities of a Leader, and that's, that's the book we train all of our NBA refs. And, and you're, you're, you're our mentor. And it's so fun. It, you know, I said, oh, good, wonderful. And, and he said, we want to take you to lunch. I said, even more wonderful. He said, we're, we're, he said, we're going to buy. I said, this is really wonderful. <laughs> and, and so I went to lunch with a half a dozen NBA refs. And, and so we had a great time, and they asked me a lot of questions on leadership, and, and, and they started asking me things about teamwork because they, they knew it back then that I was writing this book. In fact, we're going to do training with the NBA refs in the area of teamwork and, and have some fun there. But we had a wonderful, wonderful lunch, probably about a two-and-a-half-hour lunch, of which I said, I don't get this opportunity to have NBA refs around me all the time. I, so I said, I've got some questions, basketball questions. And so, of course, me loving sports and basketball, I began to really ask some questions. And one of the questions I asked is I said, who is the greatest player to ever play in the NBA? And to a man, all six of them looked at me and basically it said the same thing. Do you want us to exclude Michael Jordan? And all of a sudden I realized there were great NBA players, but these NBA refs set Michael Jordan off clear to the side because he was in a class all by himself. Now, as I probed them a little bit about what made Michael Jordan great, they said more than his skills, more than his giftedness, more than his athletic ability, more than his leaping ability, more than his all this stuff. They said what made Michael Jordan great is that if you were on Michael Jordan's team, in fact, one of the NBA refs said, think about it, John, you're in the NBA finals and Michael Jordan is one of your teammates. He said, you knew deep down inside you were going to win. You knew somehow, some way, that guy was going to be the catalyst on the team and bring your team to victory. And I can still remember watching them play Utah a couple of years ago with my son, Joe Porter, and the game was very close, and it was down the last few seconds, and the Chicago Bulls had the ball, and I said, Joel, I will guarantee you something. He said, what's that, Dad? I said, Chic uh, I, said I will guarantee you Michael Jordan will shoot the ball, and I'll guarantee you he'll make the basket. That's exactly what happened. Why? Because Michael Jordan is a catalyst. Now, Every team, to be effective, has to have that person that you just get the ball to. And here's the way I want to explain the catalyst for you. On your team, on the team that you're on, when the chips are down or where the basket needs to be made or the, the goal needs to be rate, uh, reached, who's the player that you give the ball to? That's the catalyst player. For example, the president of our Enjoy Stewardship Service Company is a man by the name of David Sutherland. And David Sutherland is not only the leader, the president of the team, he's a major catalyst. Let me explain. Several years ago, uh, Enjoy Stewardship Services is a company that helps churches raise money for building programs, debt, retirement. And, and we have a goal. Within a couple of years, we will, we will in one year raise over a billion dollars for local congregations. So we, we, we've, God's blessed us, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Okay, but back way then, back way, way back six years ago, when this company was just being started and, and Dave was ahead of it, 
uh, we, you know, if we did 30 churches a year, we were excited. And, and I'll never forget, in December, the first of December, I was going through the office one day, and I saw his wife, Roxine, and, and I said, Roxine, where's Dave? I haven't seen him for a couple of days. Oh, she said, John, she said, he's on the road. I said, what's he doing? And she said, well, you know, he has this goal he's, of, of how many organizations he wants to help raise money this year. He has this, this goal, this number. And she said, he's short of the goal. And so she said, a couple days ago, he left, and he said, Roxine, I haven't met my goal yet. I'll come home when I've met my goal. So she said, I don't know, two days, two weeks, who knows? But she said, here's what I want you to know. She said, I've lived with him now, she said, for several years. She said, here's what I know. When he comes home, he will have hit his goal. That's a catalyst, a person that is going to make it happen. So let me give you the characteristics of a catalyst. There are nine of them. Number one, intuitive. In other words, they sense things that others do not sense that makes the team successful. There's an intuitiveness about them. By the way, by the way, the best leaders, the natural leaders, the, quote, born leaders have an intuitiveness within them. In fact, the one law of the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, the one law that separates the natural-born gifted leader from the non-natural-born gifted leader is the law of intuitiveness. Intuitiveness comes with natural leadership skills. So they sense things that others do not sense. Secondly, they're communicators. They say things that others do not say that makes the team successful. And again, Winston Churchill is such a hero of mine and such a great leader. In the days when Nazi Germany was beginning to invade the other European countries, the present Prime Minister of England said there's no need to worry, he'll never come to England. Winston Churchill was the only voice that said, we need to worry, we need to be concerned. This man won't stop. He's going to conquer England if we don't do something. And what is that? That's a catalytic call. That's a catalytic communicator who's, who, when everybody else is saying one thing, says, no, 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 you don't understand. This is the way we got to go. This is what we got to do. This is what I want you to see. They're communicators that say things that others do not say. Again, always to make the team successful. Notice this. You'll see on every phrase, always to make the team successful. I'm not saying they say things others do not say. I know all kinds of people say things others do not say, and there's nothing catalytic about them. <laughs> Some of them are just downright complainers. So just because you, you don't say, well, I say things different than everybody. I must be a catalyst. No, you may be obnoxious. <laughs> you understand you say things that others do not say to make the team successful. You sense things that others do not sense to make the team successful. The third characteristic of a catalyst leader is they are initiators. They do things that others do not do that makes the team successful successful. They initiate. <laughs> you, you don't have to tell them. They're already there. In fact, I've always said, you show me a person that can initiate and you show me a person that can close. And you've got the bookends of success right there. But catalytic people are initiators. Number four, they're passionate. They feel things that others do not feel, again, that makes the team successful. They're passionate. They're like David facing Goliath, looking at the rest of the army of Israel and says, is there not a cause? I mean, he can't understand it. Why aren't you charging the big boy? Well, the way they aren't charging the big boy because they think the big boy's going to hurt him. Hello. You see, they saw the big boy and they said, he's so big he's going to hurt us. David saw the big boy and said, he's so big I can't miss. <laughs> Passion. Catalytic leaders on a team are passionate. Number five, they're creative. They think things that others do not think that makes the team successful. They're not boxy people. Uh, they have no lines. They, they jump over uh, acceptable norms to get the job done. I mean, they're, they're, they, they're, they're, again, what are they? They are make-it-happen people. They're catalytic. Number six, they are givers. 
They give things that others do not give that makes the team successful. They are second mile people. Not first mile people. Second mile people. My friend Zig Ziglar said, get on the second mile road because he says there's less traffic there. <laughs> How true that is. They, they're, they're givers. They, they, they do their part, quote, and then some. Number seven, they're responsible. They carry things that others do not carry that makes the team successful. They carry their load and then some. Number eight, they're gifted. They can do things that others cannot do that makes the team successful. There's a certain ability and giftedness that makes the difference of this team player. And number nine, they're leaders. They influence people that others do not influence that makes the team successful. Now, let's talk about it for a second. In finding a leader, in finding this, this person that, that's going to be a catalyst on your team, what I want you to understand is, is something very simple here. When people ask me to, to help them get a picture of a leader, one of the first things I share with them about leaders is leaders have the ability to make things happen. That's a fact. Leaders make things happen. In fact, l l let me put it this way. If, if, you cannot make, if you cannot make things happen for yourself, you can't make things happen for others. So the first thing you do when you're looking for a leader is look for somebody who can make things happen. Because if they have the ability to produce, if they have the ability to bring home the bacon, hello? Instead of belch out the baloney? <laughs> if, they can, if they can bring it home, if they can do it for themselves, there's a high probability they can do it for others. If you can't do it for yourself, you probably can't do it for others. So catalysts on team, they're going to somehow find a way to get you over the top. A few weeks ago, I was in London, and when I was in London, I was, I was with three wonderful friends, Andy Steimer, Tim Elmore, and Dan Ryland. Now, Tim and Dan were with me because for 20 years they've been on my team. So 20 years ago, we started the journey together, so I said, guys, let's go to London for a week and and let's do stuff we like to do. Let's do a little C.S. Lewis study. Let's do some John Wesley stuff. Let's go to some shows. And we had an incredible time. But Dan Ryland is a Beatles fan. So we went to a, a, a play of the Beatles, which he, he loved. It was, it was good. It was a good play. But then on, uh, the highlight was the last Saturday morning before we were all to take off to go back to the States. Dan said, what we need to do is we've got to go to Abbey Road. And we've got, to, we've got to go, the picture, you know, where the Beatles are crossing the street at Abbey Road. He said, we have got to take this picture at Abbey Road. And, and I said, yeah, because I, I love Beatles. So I said, yeah, you're right. We've got to go to Abbey Road. And, and I just volunteered. I said, I'll be the guy who takes the shoes off. You know what I mean? I'll be the barefoot guy. And so, so, but when, so we, got a couple, we got a taxi cab because our wives want to go. So we got a couple of taxi cabs. And so we pull up to Abbey Road, and much to our disappointment, the road's closed, and there's a big truck out there, you know, with a, kind of with the big ladders on it, and there are cones out over the road, and big, huge sign, huge sign says road closed. And our cab driver, he pulls up, goes slow, and he says, oh, he said, I'm so sorry. He said, the road's closed, and he started to pull away. I said, stop. Stop. I said, don't go. He said, the road's closed. I said, you don't understand. I said, uh, I think we can make this happen. So I got him to pull over. Now, on the way over, the cab driver told us the whole time we were going over, he kept saying to us, he said, now, guys, he said, I don't want to disappoint you, but he said, this is a pretty popular place. And he said, a whole bunch of people will be here, and usually you have to stand in line, and everybody's got their cameras, and everybody's doing their little job of going across the street, the whole deal. And so he said, I'm not trying to discourage you, but he said, this may be a, a, a long wait. Well, it says road closed. There is no wait. So I pulled, I said, pull the thing over. So we all get out, and the guys are kind of looking at me, he says, guys, hang on. And I go over to the workers of the road, the guys over there that put out all the cones and were, you know, basically doing what the workers of the road do, standing at the side of the road. <laughs> and I said, guys, you have an incredible opportunity today. I said, what's that? I said, I know it says road closed, but I said, we came from the States and we love the Beatles and we want to take a picture. 
and you have an opportunity to make it happen. And I said, all we need to do is move the cones out of the way. And I said, move the truck back just a little bit kind of position it in the right place in the road because one of the things we had talked about at dinner the night before is if you look at the, at the photo album of the Beatles going across Abbey Road, it's, it's, it's one that's looking down on the Beatles. It's not one on the street level. And so the night before we were talking about how it was going to be tough to get the picture the way it's supposed to be because we didn't have any way to go kind of top down. And when I just saw the truck, the ladder, I realized that this was the way that we would get the picture from the top down. <laughs> so I told him, I said, well, how just to move the truck just a little bit to get the picture top down there, and I, and I said, we'll help you, and so, and the kind of guys are kind of looking at each other, I said, you know, you're, you're not doing anything right now anyway, and, and no, we're not, and so they started laughing, and they started helping me pick up the cones, and so we're all moving all the stuff out of the way, it's, it's a wonderful experience, and we're having the best time, and Patty Ryan and Dan's wife, I said, now Patty, I said, you get up in the truck here, and, and get over here and get the picture, so she gets up in the truck to get the picture just the way it is, and everybody's just having a great time, and we, you know, I take my shoes off, my socks off, and we get the picture just the way we're supposed to get the picture going across there, and she's up there on top of the truck taking it, you know, and all the guys that are, are supposed to be working on the road, they're clapping and cheering us on now. And, and the cab driver, I'll never forget it, the cab driver, when we got back in the cab, looked at Andy Steimer, who was, with, who was with us, one of the four, and he saw me getting all these workers to help us out, because, well, they are workers, so it's... It, <laughs> So, so he saw me getting all the workers to help us out, and, and he looked at me, and he, he, he pointed to me, and he, he said to Andy, he said, boy, he said, that guy gets things done, doesn't he? And Andy looked at him and says, you have no idea. <laughs> we got that picture. We got back in that cab. We laughed. We had the best time all the way back. Because we got the, what we wanted to see happen. And the, and, and the road workers, they were, so, they, were, they were shaking our hands, telling us that we made their day. Because this is a very boring kind of job they've got. <laughs> now, what? very simple. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about a catalyst on a team. We're talking about the person who has the ability to make things happen. And what I know about teamwork is that although you've got a total group of people making up a team, there's got to be somebody that's going to make it happen. And you need to recognize that, and you need to support that, and you need to do everything you can to help that person bring you to victory. That's the law of the catalyst.